Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 you will hear a conversation between two people talking about insecticide. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Yes? Oh, good morning, madam. I'm from Pestaway Market Research. I'm doing consumer research in this area. I wonder if you'd mind telling me, do you use Pestaway in your home? Pestaway? Oh, the insecticide thing. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. What do you use it for, madam? Fleas, ants, cockroaches, woodworm? Oh, cockroaches. This is an old house, you see, and we often get cockroaches in the kitchen. I tried scrubbing and disinfecting, but it didn't seem to do much good. And then I heard a commercial about Pest Away, so I thought I'd try that. Was that on TV? No, it was radio, one of those early morning shows. You heard it advertised on the radio? Fine. And you say you use it in the kitchen. Do you use it anywhere else in the house? In the bathroom, say? Oh, no. We've never had any trouble anywhere else. We get the odd wasp in the summer sometimes, but I don't bother about them. It's the cockroaches I don't like. Nasty, creepy, crawly things. And you find Pest Away does the trick? Well, yes. It's quite good. It gets rid of most of them. How long have you been using it, madam? Oh, let's see. About two years now, I think. About two years. And how often do you find you have to spray? Oh, I give the kitchen a good spray round the skirtings and under the stove, you know, about every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. About every six weeks. Every six weeks or so, I see. Uh, where do you buy your pest away, madam? A supermarket? Chemist? Oh, no. I get it at the little shop at the end of this street. They stock practically everything. It means taking a bus if I want to go to the supermarket. Well, thank you very much, madam. Oh, could I have your name, please? Mrs. Edgerton. Mary Edgerton. That's E-G-E-R-T-O-N. E-G-E-R-T-O-N. And the address? The address is 12 Holly, Peterford. 12 Peterford. And may I ask your age, madam? Oh, well, just put down I'm over 50. As you like, Mrs. Egerton. And occupation? Housewife? Well, I used to be a telephonist before I married. I had a very good job at the post office, but what with a husband to look after and four children to bring up, it doesn't leave you much time, does it? Occupation, housewife. Well, thank you very much for your time, madam. You've been most helpful. 
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear two university students discussing experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Al. Sorry to interrupt you when you're having your lunch, but I wanted to ask you a favor. Oh, sure, no problem. Sit down, Josie. I've finished anyway. What do you need? Well, I was wondering if I could ask you about the experiments we were talking about in the seminar the other day with Dr. Robinson. I'm doing my teaching practice on Thursday and Friday, and I'm a bit concerned about it. I wasn't entirely sure I understood them completely. If I don't understand them, then the pupils don't have any chance. You mean the ones to determine the speed of sound? Yes, that's right. Well, I think I understood the first one, but the second one was more complicated. Yes, that's true. Well, let's check what you thought of the first one, the one that you'll have to take the kids outside for. OK, let me see. Well, you need to get two groups to stand exactly 200 metres apart on the playing fields and one has a bell or a loudspeaker or some other loud sound source and a flag and the other group has a stopwatch. Yes, although it doesn't have to be 200 metres. It's just that it makes the experiment easier the more distance between them. It depends on the space available. Right, and the idea is that one group raises the flag at exactly the same moment as they make a noise and the other group starts the stopwatch when they see the flag and stops it when they hear the noise. That's it. And then you get them to do a simple calculation of velocity equals time divided by distance. Mia, yeah. it's a bit low tech and it's not very accurate, but they should be able to get within about 20% of the actual figure if they're reasonably careful. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, so I understand that. It's the other one, the one with the tube I was having a few problems with. Can you just talk me through that and tell me exactly what I have to explain to the pupils? OK. Well, the thing to remember is that sound is a wave, and waves have both frequency and wavelength. You should start them off with exploring waves in water, and that'll introduce a few key concepts. Sound waves aren't exactly the same because they're compression waves, but it's more or less the same principle, at least for pupils at this level. I've got some ideas for that. So they understand wavelength and frequency, and then we move on to the experiment. For that we need, uh, let me just have a look at my notes, a long tube, a tuning fork, and a large barrel of water. Now, what do they do with those, and what's the point of it? It's fairly simple, really. You just have to remember that velocity equals wavelength times frequency. Ah, yes. That's the key, isn't it? Yes. The tuning fork is manufactured to produce a sound of a given frequency. So that just leaves you one thing to measure. 
The pupils hit the tuning fork so that it makes a sound and hold it toward the end of the long open tube. That makes the air vibrate. They should slowly move the tube up and down. They'll find that in some positions it gets louder. That's because of resonance. What's that again? It's when there are a whole number of waves in the column of air in the tube. It makes it louder. They then measure the length of the column of air, and they can work out the wavelength from that. And that's more accurate than the other experiment? Well, it is if the pupils take an average using different tuning forks. It should be much more accurate. Thanks, Al. That's clear to me now. I can't think of any more problems. Just make sure that the pupils keep good records. You need to tell them how important that is. Any mistakes with the maths can be corrected later, but you don't want them to have to go back and get the data again. You probably wouldn't have time for that anyway. Good advice. Yes. I just hope it goes well in the classroom now. Good luck. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So, where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Centre. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr. Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside, and it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely. They actually set up the center there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. The mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions, and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, things like sources such as rivers and wells, and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur. That was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear some facts and figures about Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, I should tell you that the country of Australia is made up of six states and two territories. These are the Australian Capital Territory, New South Wales, the Northern Territory, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and Western Australia. The national capital is Canberra. Right, let's turn to the Australian economy. Australia has a prosperous Western-style capitalist economy. Australia is a major exporter of agricultural products, minerals, metals, and fossil fuels. Commodity prices have a big impact on the economy. Australia suffered from the low growth and high unemployment typical of the OECD countries in the early 1990s, but the economy has expanded at reasonably steady rates in recent years. 
In addition to high unemployment, short-term economic problems include how to balance output and inflation and how to stimulate exports. The economy is made up like this. Agriculture, 3.1%. Industry, 27.7%. Services, 69.2%. The labor force has a similar pattern. The total labor force is 8.2 million. 34% work in finance and services. 23% work in public and community services. 20% work in the wholesale and retail trade. 17% work in manufacturing and industry. And 6% work in agriculture. What are the chief industries of Australia? They are mining, industrial, and transport equipment, food processing, chemicals, and steel. What are Australia's main agricultural products? They are wheat, barley, sugarcane, fruit, cattle, sheep, and poultry. And who do we sell our products to? At present, our chief export market is Japan, which takes 24% of our exports. After that, South Korea takes 8%, and New Zealand and the U.S. each take 7%. In years to come, however, we expect China to become a significant trade partner. China already supplies 5% of Australia's imports. This is the same amount as New Zealand. Meanwhile, we take one-fifth, in fact 22% of our imports from the U.S., 17% from Japan, and 6% from the U.K. So what sort of things does Australia import? Well, we import a lot of machinery and transport equipment, especially computers and office machines, also telecommunications equipment, and in addition we have to import oil and petroleum products. So let's move to the subject of communications in Australia. We have an estimated 8.7 million telephones and 9.2 million televisions. There are some 134 television broadcast stations and 325 radio stations. The related subject of transport is naturally very important in such a big country as Australia. Let's look at highways first. There are two kinds of highways, paved and unpaved. Paved highways are regular roads with a permanent surface. But actually, we have more unpaved highways, around 60%, than paved, when all the country roads are included. In addition, Australia has a railway network of over 38,000 kilometers. But you'll probably find it hard to believe how many airports we've got. 10? 20? 50? No, the total is 443. Of course, this includes many short runways on farms and in the outback. There are only nine airports with runways of more than 3,000 meters. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.